Why did you choose Jamie, your friend? He was the easiest. In the shooting is 15-year-old Austin. Why kill her that night? In Shadows Deep, a story unfolds of a 15-year-old whose darkness took hold. A mass killer, unheard, unseen. A chilling tale, unlike any we've seen. What drove this youth to commit such dread? In this suspenseful tale, secrets will be shed. Unveiling the depths of a twisted mind, unmasking the horrors we're bound to find. Can you picture it? A pristine mansion in the heart of Cockeysville, Maryland. Its imposing facade softened by the veil of winter in 2008. Snapshots from local newspapers capture a serene homestead, complete with an expansive front yard. A tranquility jarringly at odds with the region's unfamiliarity with homicides. At the helm is John Sr., a respected local attorney wielding his expertise at Royston, Muller, McLean, and Reed's Towson office, while Tamara, his wife, nurtures their domestic haven. Their three sons, Nicholas, the soon-to-be 16-year-old, and his younger brothers, Greg, 14, and Benjamin, 11, fill the house with youthful energy. The echoes of their laughter and the artifacts of family vacations at their property by Deep Creek Lake in Western Maryland linger in the air. Nicholas, the eldest, is more than just a teenager. He's a standout varsity lacrosse player and an honor roll student at Delaney High School in Timonium, Maryland. When he's not mastering his academics or lacrosse, he's honing his golfing and skiing skills or fostering his leadership as a committed Boy Scout. John Sr. emulates the ideal community figure, doubling as a scoutmaster and a pastor, reflecting the echoes of service and leadership in Nicholas. It paints the picture of a life of privilege, doesn't it? Perhaps it was, but beneath this glistening surface, less shiny aspects simmered unseen. The full truth? That's something we may never unravel. The only other witnesses to this life met a brutal, untimely end. Herein lies the eerie mystery of a tragically shattered suburban life. As we delve deeper into this riveting tale, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. It was an ordinary evening in early 2008, on February 1st to be precise, the chill of winter was just another backdrop in the peaceful neighborhood of Cockeysville, Maryland. Unbeknownst to the quiet community, an unimaginable horror was about to unfold, casting a long, chilling shadow over what once seemed like a storybook suburban life. Having spent the day with his friends, Nicholas Browning returned home. As he walked through the door of the familial mansion, he carried with him an intention that would shatter the serenity of his home, leaving an indelible mark on his family and reverberating shockwaves throughout the unsuspecting neighborhood. The house, just moments before buzzing with life, fell into an eerie silence as Nicholas claimed his first victim, his father John, who was laying napping on the family room couch. A tragic domino effect ensued as he ascended the staircase claiming the lies of his mother, Tamara, and his two younger brothers, Benjamin and Greg, each in their own bedrooms. Nicholas, emerging from the blood-soaked scene, sought solace in the digital realm, immersing himself in video games for five hours. As if emerging from a gruesome trance, he returned to his friends seemingly unperturbed, inviting them over for a party that very night Saturday afternoon found Nicholas returning home. He dialed 911, his voice shaking as he reported a grisly discovery, the lifeless body of his father. His friends arrived throughout the day expecting a lively party, but instead found a house full of police officers, which was ironic. A chilling confession on Sunday had Nicholas formally charged with the homicides and held without bail as an adult. 
A week after this unfathomable tragedy, Nicholas marked his 16th birthday, not amidst family and friends, but confined within the grim walls of the neighboring Baltimore County Detention Center as his family was laid to rest. This is the harrowing tale of a night that forever changed the narrative of a seemingly idyllic suburban life. In the chilling aftermath of such a horrific event, questions bubble to the surface like uneasy ghosts. What compelled Nicholas to commit such a vile act? Was it a rebellion against maltreatment, real or imagined? Or was it a perverse lust for money? Could he simultaneously be a perpetrator and a victim? Views varied, mirroring the fractured reflections of a shattered mirror. To his peers, Nicholas was often the class clown, life of the party. But the laughter he generated had a sinister undertone for some. A few reported him as a bully, with his younger brother Greg often on the receiving end of his brutal jests. The adults in his life were in shock and found it difficult to reconcile the Nicholas they knew with the picture his monstrous actions painted. John Keneally, his lacrosse coach, wrestled with disbelief at the gruesome reality. It's just out of character, he murmured in the dim light of a candlelit vigil, a stark contrast to the festive lacrosse fields. A disquieting paradox appeared. The amiable Nick, who seemingly wouldn't harm a fly, was capable of such brutal violence. Yes, isn't it often so? The student who one teacher favors might be a danger to another. The glass jokester might also be the tormentor of the marginalized and the handicapped. Nicholas was known to have rebelled when his parents insisted on a family trip to Western Maryland, preferring the company of his friends in Timonium. It was as if a splinter of discord had started to wedge itself into the fabric of his seemingly perfect life. As the community reeled from the shock, they turned to each other for comfort, seeking solace in shared grief. Mementos of love and loss, flowers, balloons, and stuffed animals started to accumulate on the front steps of the Browning residence. Vigils gathered the mourners, with one witnessing nearly a hundred attendees, while another swelled with hundreds more. In their grief, they clung to memories of happier times, of laughter shared, and of bonds forged. The young friends and classmates of Greg and Benjamin grappled with sorrow beyond their tender years. Garland Williams, the proprietor of a nearby garden business, sought to channel this collective heartache into something beautiful, creating a memorial garden at Cockeysville Middle School. This garden stood as a testament to the loss and resilience of a community grappling with an unthinkable tragedy, blooming amidst the bleakness and symbolizing the enduring spirit of humanity. Life, indeed, is a theater of ironies. And in Nicholas Browning's narrative, these ironies are strewn like macabre confetti. According to a defense psychiatrist, Nicholas talked about the murders with a disconcerting casualness, like discussing an unremarkable chore like taking out the trash. Eerily, before the murders, he had shared a chilling joke with schoolmates on a bus ride, musing about annihilating his family to expedite his inheritance. From behind prison bars, he delivered yet another dark punchline on a call with a friend. I hate justice. You have to break in and get me out of here. At his sentencing, Nicholas faced his remaining family members and his words of apology were choked with emotion. But was this a true manifestation of remorse or an unsettling performance akin to the alternating personas of Jekyll and Hyde? Nicholas's accounts, much like the man himself, were fraught with contradictions. He claimed that the sinister decision to end his parents' lives crystallized in his mind as he walked home from a friend's house. He yearned for solitary dinners, an escape from critique and chiding. And so, using his father's personal 9mm pistol, he snuffed out the lives of his family upon returning home. He insisted that he was in a trance-like state during the gruesome act, but 
law enforcement had a different perspective. They saw it as a premeditated act, their conviction further solidified by Nicholas's attempt to make the murders appear as a botched burglary. These meticulous moves did not align with a hasty decision. He labeled his parents as alcoholic abusers. Yet, ironically, he himself had a reputation for heavy drinking. His extended family corroborated his abuse allegations, a tragic revelation that, unfortunately, offered him no reprieve in court. Furthermore, he failed to explain the most heartbreaking part of the crime, the killing of his younger brothers. If abuse was indeed a part of his narrative, it surely didn't stem from those innocent lives. The threads of Nicholas's tale riddled with inconsistencies and chilling details weave a chilling tapestry of a young life tragically derailed. The stage of Nicholas's trial was rife with conflicting emotions and fraught with discordant voices. Some of his family members balked at the thought of a life sentence without parole, arguing for a future where Nicholas, having recognized the magnitude of his actions, could receive rehabilitative counseling. Their pleas echoed in the courtroom, imploring the judge for leniency. They held out hope for therapy within the prison walls, but were acutely aware of the stark reality of his situation. Despite being sentenced to four life terms, a sliver of hope remained. Nicholas could be eligible for parole in 2031, provided he availed himself of prison-based therapy. Yet, not all family members harbored such a forgiving stance. Sally Browning, sister of the slain John Browning, put pen to paper and questioned in a letter to the judge Nicholas's audacious expectation of leniency. Did he actually think he was going to be charged as a juvenile and would walk away from his crimes? There were hopes that Nicholas would be incarcerated at the Patuxent Institution in Jessup, Maryland, a mere 30 miles from Cuckeysville. This maximum security facility boasted psychological and educational programs that the family believed could benefit him. Indeed, he had spent time there, even managing to create a profile on a pen buddy network. However, fate dealt another hand. Nicholas ended up serving his sentence at the Western Correctional Institution, nestled in Cumberland, Maryland. This was a harsh 145 miles away from his former home, a grim journey that took him to a less prosperous corner of Maryland. Here, he ensnared in a world he had hoped to escape. Nicholas was now forced to face the chilling consequences of his action. What do you think, friends? What pushes a person to commit such heinous acts against their own family? And can such darkness ever truly be understood or forgiven? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you're as intrigued as we are by the complexities of the human psyche, make sure you stay tuned to our channel.